I'm Andy Shalom, I'm the owner of Busboys and Poets. We are so happy to have Rock Newman and the Rock Newman Show join our tribe here. We are a tribe. This is a place where racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted, a place where art, culture, and politics intentionally collide. This is a space to take a deliberate pause and feed your mind, body, and soul. We believe by creating such a space, we can actually change our community, change DC, and change the world for the better. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Thank you, Andy. Uh, yes, I am Rock Newman. Today is July the 18th, and to, we are celebrating here on The Rock Newman Show at Bus Boys and Poets, my diva's birthday, Nelson Mandela's birthday. Uh, coming up, we really have an action-packed show for you. Uh, in, the, um, in the 540 segment, we're going to have international uh, businesswoman and now someone who actually uh, is, works out of the uh, White House uh, administration, Alexis Denny. And in the 6 o'clock hour, it needs absolutely no introduction, world-famous humanitarian uh, Dick Gregory, one of the first people I ever heard mention the name Nelson Mandela. He was the first person I ever heard mention the name, uh, uh, Dick Gregory and his daughter Ayana. Ayana, who has a one-woman show and is going to do a, a, a segment from that one-woman uh, show that is absolutely riveting. You don't want to miss that. Also, we'll have uh, uh, Phyllis Bennett. Ben is on. And Jonathan Tuck and the DC Youth Slam. It's a, it's a group of uh, uh, poets that went to South Africa and made an incredible impact. They're here from Washington, DC. We want to celebrate them as they bring their art to the Rock Newman Show here at Bus Boys and Poets. And I'm absolutely honored to be joined in this uh, second segment uh, by South African Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul. My dear brother, thank you for joining us at the Rock Newman Show. Well, thank you very much, Rock, and great to meet you. You know, um, your, uh, I don't know how much your daddy traveled. My daddy didn't travel very much at all. But when I saw you, I started to wonder if my daddy might have traveled to South Africa. We look a lot alike. <laughs> you're, you're much more handsome than me. <laughs> but but, but I, I looked at you and was like, wow, this dude could be one of my brothers. Well, my mother was a very virtuous woman. Uh -huh. so I'm not sure that your daddy... Um, I'm going to tell you something. Impact on Let me life. tell you something about my, about my daddy. It's a lot of things you can say about it, but he's never been, he was never accused of being virtuous. <laughs> That's my daddy was a rolling stone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you have such a busy schedule today with all that is going on to honor Nelson Mandela. Uh, and I know you, you, you have a couple of more events to go, so, so I really am pleased that you were able to stop by. Uh, tell us, please, your early year recollections of Nelson Mandela and his struggle. And then I kind of want to bring it to South Africa today. I was born in the early 60s at about the same time that Nelson Mandela was jailed. And that was the years, the decade, that apartheid was triumphant. By the time I was conscious. When you, when, when you say that apartheid was triumphant? Ap apartheid was triumphant in the sense that they had jailed the cream of the liberation leadership, yes. exiled the rest of them, shot to death people at Sharpville, yes. and created a web of fear, and had sold their gold and their silver and all their minerals to the world who wanted to do business with them. Yes. They believed that they would live forever. Yes. And by the time I was conscious, the fact of the matter was that everyone was afraid of what the system could do. We were cowed into submission for about a decade since Nelson Mandela was in prison. It was really in 1973 that the dock workers in Durban and 1976 that the students in Soweto regained our courage for us. And so my recollection of Nelson Mandela was that if you speak out of line, you'll be like Nelson Mandela and go to jail. And that was the pervading fear. It was only when we regained our voice in the mid-70s tragically in Soweto, that I think that we began to see Nelson Mandela no longer as the object of our fears, but really as the harbinger of our hopes and dreams as South Africans. How, how very well said. I, I, I want to give a personal reflection. I was in South Africa in 
93, in February, late February of 93. And we went to Soweto. I was representing a gentleman who was the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And we went to Soweto to participate in the, in the, uh, in the African National Congress that year, the convention. But before that, we went into Soweto. And still in 1993, after Nelson Mandela had been released from prison, there was still this reign of terror. And how I experienced it was we were at a little small boxing gym. After we had visited some homes, huts, if you will, with dirt floors in Soweto, we went to this little shanty of a boxing gym. And it was down a hill. And while we were there, tanks rolled to the top of that hill with their armor trained to the bottom of the hill. You talk about Terra and Nelson Mandela and the hierarchy of the ANC being put in prison. And it sure didn't stop there. You talk about uh, uh, Soweto and Sharpsville. Um, recollect, please, if you would, Stephen Biko. I think Steve Biko was probably the catalyst for us regaining our voice in the 1970s. Yes, yes. I think that against this massive white power where some were willing to internalize that racism, Steve Biko spoke about us asserting ourselves as blacks. Steve Biko said that the struggle for our liberation will start with the liberation of our minds. Yeah. Mm. And so I think that his personal martyrdom um, told us that you are able to die for your beliefs. And that reawakened within us not only the spirit to attain liberation, but certainly the spirit to believe in ourselves and to believe in our dignity again hmm. and to claim our dignity again um, and not to submit to this notion that white is better than black and that we are inferior. And I think that when that spark lit um, in Soweto, it lit a fire across the country from which apartheid would never ever recover again because we had gained the most important thing. We had gained our minds, we had gained our souls, and we had freed up ourselves from the mental oppression that apartheid had tried to impose on us. We had given up our fear of standing up for who we are because we believed that who we are was worth standing up for. Yes. You know, today, as we celebrate the 95th birthday of Nelson Mandela, many in the world, far away and those close to him, didn't imagine that he would even be here with us today. But talking about having a fighter's heart for the freedom of his people, and obviously a fighter's heart to live, he remains with us today. Now, the pictures that we see today, um, they're a frail 95-year-old man, and even when he emerged from prison, he had already turned, uh, uh, started to have some white hair, like you and I, me more than you are experiencing. Um, what a lot of folks don't know about was the incredible courage and character and commitment that he demonstrated in his struggle to dismantle apartheid. Would you please walk us back to, and obviously you know the history well, and if we could get a bit of a, you know, a history lesson from you as to the efforts, the practice, the agenda of Nelson Mandela as a young man starting to dismantle apartheid. I think Nelson Mandela was very fortunate that from the very outset, he understood that individuals are important, but not important by themselves. Yes, yes. And he made common cause with other young individuals of his generation, Oliver Tambo, Walter Sisulu, Governor Mbeki, and so many others. And together, they understood that the ANC, the African National Congress, needed to be radicalized needed to be transformed from a gentleman's club into a fighting club. And thus was born the African National Congress of the 1950s, when the Youth League decided that they were going to have an agenda that no longer 
was going to send petitions to the Queen, yeah. was no longer going to simply um, ask for their rights, but were going to claim it. Yeah. Nelson Mandela started off and understood that the key to any action is a vision. Mm -hmm. There are so many people who are active all the time yeah. without a vision. Yeah. He understood that South Africans needed a vision around which to unite, and that vision came in 1955 with the Freedom Charter. And so he set out the agenda. And the, the greatest act of courage in 1955 was the statement of the Freedom Charter that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. Yes. It would have been an act of absolute popularity to simply say South Africa belonged to blacks. <laughs> he understood that courage yes. was not only the courage to die for what you stand for, but the courage to stand for what you should believe in, in what is humanity, and that South Africa would belong to all who live in it, black and white. I think by the 1960s, when peaceful protests were met with a massacre in Sharpeville, Nelson Mandela understood again that the peaceful struggles of the 1950s had to give way to something that would grab the attention of the white oppressors. Yes. And that's when he launched the armed struggle, not again in a wild, mindless militancy, sure. but in a militancy that was directed, yeah. a militancy that said, we will attack the installations that oppress us, and those were the armed installations of the apartheid state. Right. Throughout that period, whenever a civilian was caught in the crossfire, the African National Congress president, at that time Oliver Tambo, yes. was the first to stand up and apologize and to be able to make sure that our militancy was not a mindless militancy. I make that point because we live in a world that is very troubled, yeah. where people believe that every life is fair game. Right. Whether you have state power behind you, yeah. we believe that right. we can do whatever we want, never mind who we kill in the process of finding the one we targeted. Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo never ever believed that life was not sacrosanct. Yes. And it's only when you cherish life that you commit yourself to the kind of struggle that has as its end goal the fulfillment of life. Nelson Mandela understood that you've got to achieve noble ends through noble means that the ends do not justify the means. Ambassador, I know that you know, your job here is that of a diplomat, so you have to use diplomacy. What you just described there was a very principled fight for freedom, which put human life as sacrosanct. And now we live in a country that sends unarmed planes abroad, drones. Yeah, they're I, armed, but unmanned. I mean, I mean arms, yeah, unmanned, unmanned and mm -hmm. armed. I had a guest here on Saturday, Nikki Giovanni, who was talking mm -hmm. about the hip hop culture and the criticism that they used bad words. And she challenged that and said, drones is a bad word. Two words that I absolutely despise hearing are collateral damage. And the collateral damage that comes with those drones, I'd like for you to speak in the context of, again, the principled approach of the ANC leadership and what we're seeing today around the world. I think that the example that I described of an ANC president apologizing for collateral damage, I think is the most eloquent statement that can be made in the world today. Because what is the difference between an indiscriminate suicide bomber and an indiscriminate drone? I think if one asks that question and answers it honestly, there is no distinction between those who believe they act with the right of God on their side and those who believe they act with the right of democracy and peace on their side. There is no difference because their actions are not different. And so I think that what Nelson Mandela would stand for, the one leader who had the courage to say no to the Iraq war, yes. the one leader who had the courage to phone up First, President Bush at that point, yeah. who didn't take his call, right. who put Condoleezza Rice on the line and said, speak to her. He said to Condoleezza, is your president putting a black person to speak to a black person? I don't want to speak to you. And then phoned the father and said, can you sort your son out? Yeah. Um, 
that was the Nelson Mandela I know. And that was the Nelson Mandela who understood that you don't trade your values for your interests. Hmm. The, it's, inextric it's inextricably linked, the struggle that was South Africa and the struggle that Randall Robinson and Trans Africa helped to, helped to foster. Can you please talk a little bit to our audience about how you as a South African saw the impact of the kind of effort that Trans Africa, the Congressional Black Caucus, had on the liberation of South Africa? I don't think I can top what I said this morning in the halls of Congress. But I want to really say that there was no reason for ordinary Americans to stand up in the way they did for a people they never knew and a country they may not have visited. But for them to have done what they've done is an enormous act of solidarity. Not only was it symbolic, it was effective. And I think that it's amazing if you consider that here were people who marched for South Africa. Here were people who were arrested for South Africa, refused to drink our wine, refused to eat our fruit, refused to unload our goods, refused to send cars to us. These were ordinary Americans, and they were not only confronting their own president, they were confronting global apathy. They were people who had to make a distinction between whether the fight against communism was more important than the fight for human rights in South Africa. Right. And they chose right. fighting for human rights in South Africa without necessarily supporting anything else um, in this world. And I think that that's absolutely critical. It produced enormous heroes amongst um, South Africa's people. We too sang, we shall overcome. Yeah. We too sang, freedom isn't free. Yeah. We borrowed liberally from the writings of Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, and many others. And we too had our debates about which path to follow yes. between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Yes. Sometimes we came out on the side of Malcolm X a bit more. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that we understood that here was a struggle in the United States. Here were organizations like Trans Africa, the Free South Africa Movement, the Southern African Support Program, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, and so forth. And we absolutely understood. That's why one of the first things Nelson Mandela did when he was released from prison was to say, I must go to the United States. I must visit the cities that were at the forefront of standing up for my freedom and the freedom of South Africa and against apartheid. And that is why I came here and visited eight cities in a two-week period. Everyone said, Mr. Mandela, can you afford to give up two weeks yeah. when your country is so fragile? Yes. He said, if I do not go to thank all of those people in the United States and everywhere else in the world, the freedom in South Africa will not be worth the paper that it's written on. What a tremendous statement. This has been the quickest 36 minutes in the history of radio. I could talk to you guys for the rest of the night. I know you've got other events to go to. Thank you both, Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul uh, from South Africa and Nicole Lee from Trans Africa. Thank you so much for joining us at the Rock Newman Show. Thank you. Thank you.